And well, thank you all for sharing some of your thoughts. Um, and, and I've got some thoughts I want to share with you today. Today's going to be a, maybe a little less um, intellectual or academic. It's going to be a little more reflective and um, hopefully um, contemplative and, and help hopefully give you some images and some ideas to think about when you're reflecting on your relationship with God and trying to walk with Jesus in this really challenging moment that we're in. Um, my mind, uh, my mind's getting back to where it was. COVID kind of clouded my thinking a little bit the last couple of weeks, but I'm feeling back to normal. So this message is, is fairly simple, actually, but it's something that God has been speaking to me and hopefully can give you all a measure of hope um, as we continue to move forward and walk with Jesus uh, through the next upcoming weeks and days and months ahead. So this week I've been thinking a lot, um, been reflecting a lot. Um, God has been kind of speaking to me and inspiring me and motivating me to keep uh, pressing forward. And, and I made a post on Facebook earlier in the week just reflecting some of my personal uh, thoughts about the election and about particularly an issue that has been so important to me um, over the last many years. It's the issue, issue of how we treat and love our immigrant neighbors. And, and a young man that, that I knew a few years ago responded to the post I made on Facebook. And here's what he said in, in his comment. He said that I'm afraid to tell people I'm a Christian because it's become synonymous with intolerance and hate in so many circles. Two things Jesus himself would have never stood for. So he's saying that, that it's hard for him to even want to tell people he's a Christian because being a Christian has become associated with intolerance and hate for a lot of people. And he doesn't think that that's what Jesus stood for. And, and I have to agree with my friend. Um, sometimes I don't want to tell people I'm a pastor, to be honest. Sometimes I don't want to tell people I go to church or I'm part of this religion called Christianity. And and it's not because I'm ashamed of those things, but it's because people have done so much harm under the banner of Christianity. Recently, I've been just very discouraged by the way that many Christians, particularly evangelical Christians in America, have totally aligned themselves with the interest of the American empire. You know, if you want to upset White Christians, here's a good, it's a good chance you can do it by just doing this. Go to their church and speak truth about the ugly side of America. America's got good things, but speak about the ugly side of America and good chance you'll get run out of there. The times that people have gotten the most upset with me is when I've criticized something about our nation and our nation's values. I saw some folks uh, in the town square of Asheville, North Carolina on Friday night with a sign that said this. They said, honk if you love Jesus and if you love America. So honk if you love Jesus and love America. And I thought it was interesting. Those two things were the two that they wanted to know if you loved. There are many things that I love about America, but America and Jesus aren't of equal importance in my life, and nor should they be. In fact, my love for Jesus actually has led me to identify less with America and its values. And this was true for the Thessalonians. When the Thessalonians gave their lives to the way of Jesus, they implicitly and explicitly rejected much of the way of Rome. When they declared Jesus was the Son of God, they were also declaring that Caesar is not the Son of God. To put it very simply, the new Christians in Thessalonica started worshiping Jesus and following his way, which meant they could no longer worship Rome and follow the Roman way. You see, they saw something in Jesus that was true, that was hopeful, that was beautiful, they saw Jesus as the answer, the one who could change everything for them. They heard Jesus call out to them, and they decided to give his way a try. And I'll tell you, the Jesus way wasn't easy for them. 
Their neighbors turned on them. Friends rejected them. They even faced persecution for worshiping Jesus instead of the emperor. And so Paul, he loved them so much. So he wrote them a letter because he wanted them to be encouraged and to stay focused and to not give up and to keep choosing Jesus. This letter from Paul would have helped them find the power to persevere and to stand firm in the face of great challenge. That's what 1 Thessalonians is about. It's about encouraging these new Christians to stand firm and really trying to help them find the power to persevere in the face of great challenge. Here's the thing about the Christians in Thessalonica. They didn't make a one-time decision to follow Jesus. We've often boiled down our faith to this. I gave my life to Christ. No, they had to wake up every single day and make a choice to keep on keeping on, to keep on following the way of Jesus in the face of opposition and great challenge. You see, I don't believe that the life of faith is about believing a set of propositions or beliefs about God. The life of faith is saying yes to Jesus over and over and over again. It truly is walking with Jesus every moment of the day. It's not about religion. It's about faith. Lecrae has a new book out called How I Lost My Religion But Found My Faith. I like that because I think in many ways we've got to lose the religion so that we can find faith. Faith is about walking with Jesus every moment of the day. You know, I love the idea of walking because my wife and I, we love to walk. We've developed a great love for walking. We walk to work most days. We go on walks in the evenings. We like to to walk on trails and hike. We both like to do... uh, walking meetings. Laura does these a lot. Instead of sitting in an office having a meeting, uh, she'll go on a walk uh, with her staff to have that meeting. Do any of you all like to walk? You know, I think that my love for walking was solidified four years ago um, when I walked 300 miles across Spain uh, on this ancient path called the Camino de Santiago. And every day uh, on this path, we'd have to wake up about 5.30 in the morning. We'd pack up our backpacks and we would start walking to the next place in our journey. And we'd often walk 15, 20, even up to 25 miles in a day. And, and it was a 21-day journey of ups and downs, of joys and struggles. And it truly was an amazing, life-changing experience. Every day we had to wake up and decide that we were going to keep walking. We had to decide that we were going to keep going. Some days I didn't want to keep going. Some days we were exhausted. Every day we were sore and I got hurt. You know, I hurt my knee. And some days it was so hot and there was no shade and, and, and it was hard to keep going. When we would stop to take a lunch break or get a snack, Sometimes, man, that seat felt so good. And I'm like, I don't want to get up and keep walking. I'm sore. My body's hurting. Can we just sit a little longer? No, we had to keep walking. Until the journey was done, we had to keep moving. We had to keep moving forward until we reached our destination. And when we reached the end of our journey, to be honest, at the end, I was a little bit let down. (laughs) When we got to Santiago de Compostela, the the final destination, I was actually kind of sad to reach the end. I felt very accomplished, but reaching the end was not as exciting as I thought it would be. And, And I learned something through that experience. And here's what I learned. I learned that the journey is often the destination. Y'all know what I mean? That the journey is often actually the destination. It's what we're searching for. It's the journey that brings the transformation. It's the journey that teaches us. It's the journey that brings wisdom and life and transformation. The transformational part of my time in Spain, it was the daily grind of waking up each day and choosing to keep walking. Years ago, when I was a freshman in college, 
um, back maybe I think it was around 2001, 2002, something like that. I, I served as an altar minister at the Igthus Music Festival in Wilmore, big Christian music festival that used to be out in Wilmore. And, and I, 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 I signed up to be an altar minister, partly, probably should have realized that I shouldn't have done it when I signed up just because I knew I could get a free ticket. And I'm like, oh, I can, I can pray with somebody in a tent, right? No problem. And so I went to this training where they trained me on how to lead someone to Christ. And so what, one image that they taught us was like this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what the image looked like on the screen. Um, and you've probably seen this before. Uh, but basically, there are two cliffs, and they're separated by a large canyon. And there's no way to get from one side to the other. One side is death and sin, and the other side is God and life. And then what happens is you put the cross in between those two cliffs, and so the cross becomes a bridge, and it's Jesus, and he becomes the bridge to help us get to God. And one night at Igthus, I was um, in the tent, and, and so keep that image in your mind. All right, so I was in the tent, and the, the speaker that night preached a really powerful, cool message, you know. And so there was a big old line of people waiting to come to the altar uh, minister tent. And I'm sitting there nervous, like, who's going to come? Who am I going to pray with? I was very nervous about the situation. And then a guy about my age was assigned to come pray with me. And, and he came to me in that tent, um, just feeling God's presence. He was feeling Jesus calling out to him. And he really wanted to just know Christ and give his life to Jesus in his way. And so I remembered, oh, the cliff image. I got to explain this. So I started explaining the cliffs and the cross and the bridge. And it seemed kind of disingenuous and insincere when I did it. Uh, it fell very flat. And I don't think he was very inspired by the way that I portrayed the gospel to him. He came to that tent feeling called to a life of meaning and purpose. And I gave him a boring uncompelling vision of being saved from hell. I don't really like the bridge illustration anymore because I've come to learn that my relationship to God has not been this one-time event where I decided to cross that bridge and be forgiven. My life of faith cannot be boiled down to simply praying a prayer, receiving a sin cleansing, and then being saved from hell. My life of faith has been a journey of walking with Jesus. My life of faith has been a journey of walking with Jesus. And, and not to be crass, but it's been hard as hell sometimes. It's been awesome. It's been full of joy, but also abounding in struggle. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, 2, uh, 2, 2, Paul describes the life of faith as a walk as a walk. I want to show you this scripture because it's so powerful. He says basically that we encouraged you, we implored you, we challenged you Thessalonian Christians to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The uh, Greek philosophers described life as a walk. Walking on pilgrimage has been deeply powerful for many of our world's religions. Nelson Mandela described his journey of faith as a long walk of freedom. Black freedom fighters have deeply resonated with the idea of walking and marching together towards freedom. Walking has been a powerful practice and image for so many people seeking deeper meaning and change and purpose and fulfillment. For Paul in the New Testament, the life of faith is a long journey of walking with Jesus. Keep that in your mind, walking with Jesus. I want to give you an image to think about. Have any of you ever gone on a walk with a small child? <laughs> like tried to go on a walk through your neighborhood with a small child. I'm talking about a really small child who is slow and curious and very unfocused. <laughs> I'll tell you, it can be excruciatingly difficult, right? Because to walk just a short distance takes 
a while. There are plenty of detours, but you got to stay right there with that child, walking with her, redirecting her, encouraging her, smiling and affirming her explorations, right? And this is how, at least this week, I'm thinking of my journey with Jesus, that, that he's the parent inviting me to come on an adventure. And I am the small, curious, unfocused child who struggles to stay on course. Jesus is the loving parent who keeps urging me to stay on the right path, allows me to take some detours, affirms my curiosity, and never leaves me behind. Since my freshman year in the debacle of the Ichthus prayer tent, I've tried to reimagine my faith. One image that keeps coming back to me is a walk. Faith as a long walk with Jesus. Faith as a long walk with Jesus. He's patient with me. He gives me freedom to explore. He encourages me, and he keeps calling me to go further with him into the unknown. At different stages of my life, Jesus has said to me, hey, John, come on, let's keep walking. We're not there yet. I've got some risk I want you to take. I've got some places I want to take you that you've never been before. The last six years of pastoring this church have been a wild ride. We've been through a lot. I've learned so much. I've unlearned so much. I've wanted to quit. I've loved it. I've hated it. It's been a journey. And I'm different now. Some of y'all have watched me grow up in this church, and you know I'm different now. I'm not the same I was when I first started walking with Jesus. And the cool thing is, I won't be the same in five more years if I keep walking with Jesus, and neither will you if you keep walking with Jesus. And it's because Jesus does not waver in his commitment to see the world restored and transformed. He doesn't waver from that commitment. He does not waver in his commitment to you or to me. And as long as we're willing, he's going to keep leading us and he's going to keep walking with us and he's going to keep changing us for the better. But we've got to keep walking with him. I love the last part of that verse too. I'm going to throw it on the screen again. He says, basically, walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. It's, really, it's a present verb. It's who is calling you into his own kingdom and glory. Into his own kingdom and glory. You know, walking with a way in a way that's worthy of God, it's, it's really all about the kingdom. Not our kingdoms that we've created, but the kingdom of God. We don't get to pick the destination where we're traveling to. We don't even get to pick the path. Jesus picks the destination. He decides where we're going and he knows the path to get there and he invites us to join him on the adventure. Perhaps what's happened in American Christianity is that we have decided to change the destination and we've tried to pick a new way to get to where we want to go. We've said to Jesus, we're not going there and we're not going that way. You mean, you mean to tell me that the poor have the best seat at the table? No, nah, no, nah, we're not going to be walking in that kingdom. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that I've got to love my neighbor as much as I love myself? This is America. Don't tread on me and don't tell me what to do. No, nah, we're not walking in that kingdom. You're trying to tell me to practice nonviolence and refuse to study the art of war? This is America. What are you talking about? We're the most powerful nation in the world. We're not walking in that kingdom. You mean to tell me? that I've got to share the money that I've worked hard for. What's mine is mine. We're not walking in your kingdom, Jesus. You see, Jesus is calling us to walk with him. But he picks where we're going. He picks the destination and he chooses the path that we're going to take. And of course, he's going to show us grace. He's going to be patient with us. He's going to let us make mistakes. But he's not going to go our way. Jesus has a way he's going. He's got his own mission. The Holy Spirit's working and the spirit of Jesus is, is alive and well in the Holy Spirit and the spirit has a mission and, and, and the spirit don't follow our lead. We follow the lead of the spirit. And here's another thing I want you to think about, okay? If you're going to walk with Jesus, you don't get to walk alone. 
You've got to join all the others that Jesus has called, and you've got to walk with them too. Something that makes me really sad, um, and I think someone even kind of mentioned like something like this in our comments today. Something that makes me so sad is that many of my white brothers and sisters are refusing to walk alongside their black and brown brothers and sisters as they follow Jesus to freedom. It makes me sad. So many Christians are refusing to walk alongside their poor neighbors as they are following Jesus to freedom. Too many Christians are refusing to walk alongside their lesbian and gay and bisexual and trans and queer neighbors as they are following Jesus to freedom. If we're going to walk with Jesus, we have to walk with all of Jesus' friends too. It's a community. You see, Jesus has a mission And his mission is to establish the beloved community and to partner with that ragtag group of diverse Jesus followers to restore the world to a place of peace and love and justice. I'll say it again. Jesus has a mission and his mission is to establish the beloved community and to partner with this ragtag group of diverse Jesus followers to restore the world to a place of peace in love and justice. And Jesus is calling each of us to take the risk and to walk with him. And walking with Jesus is risky because he's going to lead you into some uncomfortable situations. He'll introduce you to some people that you may have preferred to keep away from. He will challenge us to speak up and fight for peace and justice and love. He'll always take us deeper to the heart of the matter of the gospel. Walking with him will change your life and you can play a part in the restoration of our world. I am discouraged right now to be a Christian in America, but I have not lost hope. The Thessalonians faced so much challenge. Uh, Their walk of faith was so hard and discouraging, but they found the power to persevere and to stand firm through staying close to Jesus on the wall. This morning, I found inspiration and power through listening to Mahalia Jackson sing these words. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Oh, while I'm on this tedious journey, I want Jesus to walk with me. Be my friend, Lord, be my friend. Be my friend, Lord, be my friend. While I'm on, Lord, this pilgrim journey, I need you, Jesus, to be my friend. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. Don't leave me alone. While I'm on this pilgrim journey, I need you, Jesus, to walk with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.